My name is Barbara Tepelupak. I'm former academic dean and professor of English at SUNY and also author or editor of a number of books on film adaptation and silent film, including literary adaptations in Black American cinema from Michelle Morrison, early race filmmaking in America, silent serial sensations, the Wharton Brothers and the Magic of Early Cinema, and Richard E. Norman and race filmmaking. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to provide an introduction to Finding Their Voices, the representation of African-American women in silent film. As I hope you'll agree, the program is especially urgent and timely because it helps us to appreciate where we are today in terms of race and gender relations by understanding how we got here and specifically how some of the most persistent misrepresentations and damaging and injurious stereotypes of African-American women had their genesis in silent film, which was America's first truly mass medium and how those stereotypes took root in the American consciousness and imagination. This program series hosted by the Norman Studio Silent Film Museum in Jacksonville is supported by a grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which I gratefully acknowledge. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program by me or by the other presenters do not necessarily represent those of Florida Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. To that disclaimer, I would also like to add my own personal caveat. In these days of political and racial divisiveness, including the politically charged debate over critical race theory and the misguided attempts to ban the teaching and promotion of inclusive concepts such as race and gender discrimination, it can be challenging and problematic to speak at all about race and racism, but it is definitely a necessary conversation. And I hope one that this program series will initiate, inspire and encourage. After all, it's only by an honest examination in a socio-historical context of the genesis of racial and gender defamation in silent cinema that we can identify and counter the persistence and perpetuation of that imagery today. Let's begin our conversation with a familiar and easily recognizable figure, Hattie McDaniel as a mammy, one of the most iconic characters in American social and cinema history. It's been more than 80 years since McDaniel became the first black movie star to win an Academy Award. She won for her outstanding 1939 performance as Scarlett O'Hara's Mammy in Gone with the Wind. The following spring, the Academy Awards were held at the famed Coconut Grove nightclub in the Ambassador Hotel in Beverly Hills, California. It was the 12th annual celebration of the A Academy Awards and most of Hollywood's biggest names were there, including her co-stars, Clark Gable, Vivian Lee and Olivia de Havilland. But Hattie, who was a close personal friend of Clark Gable, did not sit at the table with the rest of her Gone with the Wind cast. The hotel was segregated, so Hattie and her escort sat alone at a solitary table in the back of the ballroom. And if you look closely at the arrow at the bottom of the photograph, you can spot Hattie wearing the extravagant camellia in her hair. In fact, producer David Selzing had to call in a special favor just to allow her to enter the hotel. Like other Oscar-winning actors and actresses, she would go on to have a long film career. But unlike her white counterparts for whom the prestigious acting award provided opportunities to play a wide variety of roles, Hattie found herself cast in the same part over and over and over again. In fact, in more than 70 of the 90 plus films in which she was credited. And notably, there were scores of additional films in which she didn't even receive a credit. Here, for example, is Hattie in Blonde Venus alongside Marlena Dietrich with Mae West in I'm No Angel, with Katherine Hepburn in Alice Adams, with Shirley Temple in The Little Colonel, with Irene Dunn in Showboat, with Oliver Hardy in Zenobia, in Walt Disney's Song of the South. And when Hattie finally made the big leap to the new medium of television, she played Beulah, the maid. As a black woman, Hattie McDaniel became the embodiment of Mammy, one of the earliest, most enduring and most pernicious stereotypes that limited and restricted excellent and highly talented black performers to servile roles in early dominant white film. We'll get back to those stereotypes in just a moment. First though, I would like to consider and to discuss with you the historical circumstances that defined and circumscribed Hattie McDaniel's performances and those of so many other talented African-American actresses and that gave rise to the unfortunate and persistent cinematic stereotypes in the first place. The emergence of cinema coincided with the turn of the 20th century. The early decades of that century were an era in which the United States was establishing its industrial might and asserting itself as the up and coming, if not the dominant economic power in the world. 
recent immigration had changed the nature and appearance of American society. And for most citizens or aspiring citizens, it was a time of great hope and great promise, but not so much for black Americans. For them, it was a time of great challenge. The return of white supremacy and the steady disenfranchisement of black voters through grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literacy tests, residency requirements, and other restrictive practices around the turn of the century crushed the hopes that they had for political change at the ballot box. And sadly, we are now witnessing some of those same practices threaten to make an unwelcome return in many parts of our country today. The reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan reinforced black sense of helplessness in the face of brutal racial injustice. Originally formed during Reconstruction in the aftermath of the Civil War to suppress radical Republicans, the Klan had virtually disbanded after whites in the South regained ascendancy and drove blacks off the voting rolls. But it was reestablished with a fresh and a horrifying vigor in 1915 by a preacher from Atlanta, Georgia named William J. Simmons. Earlier that year, the Klan's fire of hatred were fanned to almost unimaginable proportions by the release of D.W. Griffith's venomously racist film, The Birth of a Nation. Within mere months of its release, despite the grossly inflated prices that were being charged for admission, that film had already been seen, according to some estimates, by one out of every four Americans. That's an astounding number. And it created a reinforced unfortunate stereotypes that would be perpetuated by other filmmakers for decades to come. Moreover, the film was reputed to be the most effective recruiting tool for the Klan, which used it almost as a documentary to air white supremacist grievances and to attract millions of like-minded followers. And indeed, by the mid-1920s, the Klan had evolved into a national organization that claimed four to five million members. The Klan's most public and sensational method of terror was lynching, a way that whites exercised social control by reasserting white dominance. Lynching was a deliberately performative and ritualized act of violence through its displays of lynched bodies, as well as through representations of the violence that circulated long after the lynchings themselves were over. In other words, there were actual lynching souvenirs, which included photographs of ballads, songs, and the lurid narratives. Perhaps the most popular and ubiquitous lynching souvenir, and also the cheapest, was the postcard. Here is one grisly example the card reads, I send this beautiful photograph. This is one who died by the unwritten law yesterday. Lynching more was hardly an isolated act. According to Skiggy Institute records, an average of 66 lynchings occurred annually between 1900 and 1925. And in all likelihood, the actual number was far higher. Throughout the South, and even in states as far west as Nebraska and California, and as far north as Indiana and Illinois, Innocent black men, women, and children were hanged, tortured, or burned alive. Black homes and businesses were destroyed, and thousands without legal protection or recourse were driven out of their towns. Historians report that in the years following the rebirth of the Klan, the strongest, most active, and most violent branch was in Florida. In fact, in Ocoee, near Orlando, on the day of the presidential election in 1920, in the worst ever election day violence in American history, the Klan murdered almost 60 African Americans and ran another 200 out of town after they attempted to exercise their legal and democratic right to vote. According to the Orlando Sentinel, for decades that massacre was silenced, erased, or repressed. Last year, the Sentinel confirmed, was the first time it was even taught statewide. And between 1890 and 1920, at least 161 Blacks were lynched in Florida alone, a rate three times higher than Alabama and twice as high as Mississippi, Georgia, and Louisiana. Additionally, Florida's constitution disenfranchised Black people and prohibited integrated education. While Jim Crow laws in Florida, as in other states, established and enforced racial housing covenants that forbade Blacks from living next to whites. Seeking to escape the violence, many Blacks migrated north, but even there they found little respite. In fact, they experienced new, albeit different problems like ghettoization, that is being forced to live like second-class citizens in undesirable or segregated areas of cities and in crowded tenements only years before it's been occupied by the very poorest of immigrants. Even the Supreme Court contributed to the racial division. With its Plessy v. Ferguson decision of 1896, the court upheld the constitutionality of state laws that provided separate but equal accommodations for Blacks, a precedent that aided the spread of segregation in public places and on public transportation throughout the nation, and encouraged other legislation that codified racial discrimination. 
the Jim Crow laws named for a racist 19th century minstrel song written and performed in blackface by white actor Thomas Dartmouth, nicknamed Daddy Rice, ensured that the separation of races was observed in restaurants, hotels, railroad stations, schools, parks, beaches, cemeteries, brothels. Even courts used different Bibles to swear in whites and people of color. You may remember hearing about a 1919 incident in Chicago when a black youngster at a Lake Michigan beach allegedly swam across the invisible line that separated the black beach from the white beach. For crossing that line and thus inadvertently integrating the beach, he was beaten to death by whites. His murder was one of mobilizing events that led to the race rioting of the so-called Red Summer of 1919. In fact, contrary to racist opinion, Blacks of that period were remarkably industrious. They had begun actively seeking leadership roles in their own communities, and by the 1920s in Congress as well. They founded and published newspapers, including the influential Chicago Defender and the New York Age. And they formed powerful and enduring civic and protest organizations that championed Black causes and mobilized dissent, like the National Negro Business League in 1900, founded by Booker T. Washington, and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909, which grew out of an earlier movement founded by W.B. Du Bois. Yet even as Blacks protested their humiliating and inequitable treatment, they readily demonstrated their patriotism. Black families bought millions of dollars in Liberty Bonds, while young Black men volunteered for military service despite the fact, and let us never forget this, they were prohibited from serving alongside white soldiers in the army, were afforded only the most menial positions in the Navy and were excluded entirely from the Marines. And despite the fact that many politicians expressed grave concern about placing deadly firearms into black hands. Notably, the black 369th Infantry Regiment, the Harlem Hellfighters, assigned to the French Army saw more days in combat than any other American unit. And it was the first allied unit to reach the Rhine. For their extraordinary bravery, the Hellfighters were awarded the prestigious Croix de Guerre, the only American soldiers to receive that honor. Yet the democracy the Black troops fought for overseas was denied them once they returned home. In 1919, soldiers still in uniform were among the victims of lynching by whites who wanted to restore the pre-war social order of race subservience. At the same time, Blacks were also making enormous strides in education at such prestigious institutions as Tuskegee, Hampton, and Howard in science and in the arts, in literature through the poetry of Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Langston Hughes, the novels of Charles Chestnut and Jesse Fawcett, and the folkloric tales of Zora Neale Hurston, about whom Dr. Christina Baker will be speaking later in this program series. In music with such blues and jazz greats as Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, and in professional musical theater with incomparable performers such as Ethel Waters, Bill Bojangles Robinson, and Eubie Blake. And the flourishing of a Black Renaissance that originated in Harlem gave rise to a new Black aesthetic and to a vision of the new Negro as an outspoken advocate for race pride and equality, unwilling to tolerate Jim Crow discrimination. Yet forging a strong Black voice in the new medium of cinema, the most accessible and popular form of mass entertainment in the early 20th century, proved considerably more complicated. That's because most early filmmakers were white and they simply participated in the life of their culture absorbing and reflecting the racism of their era, casual or vitriolic, conscious or intellectualized. Consequently, although black characters had appeared on film almost from the beginnings of cinema in the 1890s, racial representation remained static or retrogressive. So there was a startling disconnect between the representation of blacks in cinema and the reality of blacks in American society. Blacks therefore found themselves typed in outrageous and demeaning characters that marginalize them, burlesque their everyday lives and emphasize their servile behavior. Many of these stereotypes derived from the popular white literature of the day, which attempted to mask the disturbing social realities with depictions of blacks as simple folk, nostalgic for the old ways of the genteel South, as in the stories of Thomas Nelson Page. Alternatively, some novelists such as the divisive and provocative Thomas Dixon, incidentally another minister, whose novels were later adopted to film by D.W. Griffith as The Birth of a Nation, portrayed Blacks as vicious and misguided brutes who threatened an Edenic land of mosses and magnolias and whose behavior demanded the restoration of the so-called natural order. Other popular entertainments, such as the ubiquitous minstrel shows, further glorified the plantation tradition as a model for the subjugation of Blacks and reinforced the racist codes. <clears throat> 
Part of that minstrel tradition was the long-standing practice of blackface, in which white performers donned outlandish costumes and heavy burnt cork makeup to give them an exaggerated and comical appearance. Blackface permitted whites away to demean blacks even further by illustrating even more vividly and visually the prevailing racist beliefs about the limited abilities of blacks who are portrayed as simpletons, clowns, and stooges. On screen, the use of blackface by white actors was pervasive and appalling, and not just in the silent era. Over the years, some of Hollywood's top actors assumed the racist posture. Judy Garland, Shirley Temple, Laurel and Hardy, The Three Stooges, Bing Crosby, Charlie McCarthy, Edgar Bergen's dummy, and everyone's favorite rascally rabbit, Bugs Bunny. Such demeaning and pejorative racial imagery became indelibly etched in the American imagination and reinforced existing racial prejudice, encouraged racial division, and reduced real Blacks to real Blacks. And that brings us specifically back to our discussion of stereotypes. Among the earliest and most enduring stereotypes was that of the self-sacrificing Uncle Tom, Today, the character most immediately associated with Black servility and subservience. Uncle Tom first appeared in Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel of protest against the passage in 1850 of the Fugitive Slave Act that enforced the return of escaped slaves to their owners. Stowe's Tom was a remarkable and unusually strong character who suffered tremendous hardships, but remained faithful to God as well as to his own principles. And it made his martyrdom precipitated by his refusal to betray another slave as redemptive as it was tragic. Yet even before the final serial installment of the novel was published in 1852, Stowe's eponymous character had become a vital part of American popular culture and generally not in a positive way. His story routinely truncated to eliminate the harsh reality of his suffering and martyrdom, which after all was the whole point of Stowe's novel, was so frequently dramatized throughout the second half of the 19th century and into the early 20th century that it became known as the world's greatest hit. In addition to the legitimate American stage versions, there were lucrative Tom spectacles, like the one mounted by renowned showman P.T. Barnum, Uncle Tom musical extravaganzas and parades, and of course, countless parodies and crude takeoffs. For example, the comic cartoon Uncle Tom's Bungalow ends with Uncle Tom buying back his own freedom in a game of craps and driving away in a Rolls Royce. And in Uncle Tom's Cabana, Tom turns his slave cabin into a lucrative juke joint featuring a not so little Miss Eva performing cabaret. Common to almost all of the Tom productions, however, was the distortion of the title character himself. Increasingly, Stowe's dignified and exemplary Uncle Tom was portrayed as a happy, sappy, woolly, white-haired plantation slave content to abide by his master's wishes. Such a vulgarizing not only carried a message substantially different from the novel's strong condemnation of slavery, it encouraged the perception of Tom's acquiescence and obedience as a model of good racial behavior. Incredibly, some of the film versions even tried to give the Tom story a happy ending to prove that slavery really wasn't that bad after all. Just as Tom became the model of the submissive but contented slave that white moviegoers wanted him to be, Mammy became a character that white audiences grew to love. In fact, Mammy became iconic in advertising as early as the 1870s when her face and figure began appearing on boxes of pancake mix and baking powder and peanuts and detergent. Her broad toothy smile assured American consumers that the product in question was dependable and reliable, just like Mammy herself. That same racial iconography carried over to early cinema as well. A staple of the so-called genre of plantation movies, Mammy was usually middle-aged, dowdy, big, and dark, often exaggeratedly so as in the many early films in which she was played by white actresses in blackface. But whereas most servants were respectful, Mammy could be cantankerous and feisty, albeit in a good natured and familiar way that made her behavior seem acceptable, even affectionate. And her irrepressibility and single-minded devotion to those whom she served endeared her to white audiences. Mammies also tend to be loyal and non-threatening, especially in their sexuality. Think back to McDaniel's Mammy and Gone with the Wind. She prides herself on the fact that she has diapered three generations of O'Hara women and is privy to all of Scarlet's secrets from her infatuation with Ashley Wilkes for enduring love for Rhett Butler. Mammy, in fact, is an essential part of Scarlet's family. But what do we know about Mammy's family? And what's Mammy's real name? We never learn it. She is, in effect, almost totally depersonalized and reduced to her servant position. She is simply Mammy. Typical of McDaniel's character and of all film mammies, especially in the silent film era, was their absolute devotion and their willingness to sacrifice themselves and even their own families for Missy and Massa, 
supposedly endearing terms that found their way into scores of early film titles. In Mammy's Ghost, for example, Mammy hides Colonel Berkeley and his son from Union soldiers and later cares for the boy throughout the war until his father returns. In Old Mammy's Secret Code, Mammy sacrifices even more. She uses her laundry line to signal in code from inside Grant's headquarters, an act of treason for which she is executed by the Yankees. And in Old Mammy's Charge, Mammy travels north with her mistress, Beatrice Prentice. After Beatrice and her husband die, she cares for their daughter and endures many hardships until Major Prentice, little Beatrice's grandfather, finds them and takes them back home to the South. Now just imagine that. The film expects us to believe that Mammy willingly leaves the freedom of the North to return to bondage in the South. Notably in the films that I've just referenced, all the title characters are played by white actresses in blackface. But it was not just the plantation era Mammy who displayed such unconditional devotion. The Mammy stereotype in a slightly more modern guise found its way into numerous sound films as well. Most famously, perhaps the 1934 film, Imitation of Life, based on the novel by Fanny Hurst, in which Aunt Delilah, played by the superb Louise Beavers, not only tends the household of the widowed Miss B, played by Claudette Colbert, but also turns the impoverished B into a multi-millionaire by sharing with her an old family recipe for pancakes. Now let's pause for a second and consider those names. Miss B, Aunt Delilah, another not particularly subtle throwback to plantation stereotypes. The recipe makes Delilah wealthy as well, although disproportionately since B gets 80% of all of the profits and Delilah gets a mere 20%. Yet Delilah begs B not to send her away, reiterating her desire to stay on as a cook for B and as caretaker for B's daughter, even though Delilah has a daughter of her own. Delilah's desire not to leave Bee's home finds its parallel in the early screen Mammy's desire never to leave the plantation, just as Delilah's self-effacing Christian stoicism, again like that of earlier times and Mammy's, allows her to accept her fate of inferiority and to resign herself to other social injustices. Apart from Tom and Mammy, there were other notable and pejorative racial stereotypes in early silent films. A particularly vicious and lingering type was the doltish character described by critic Donald Bogle and others as the Sambo, or by some other similar names that are even more unsavory and that I will not repeat here, who served as a figure of laughter for white audiences. Film historian Stanley Elkins described the Sambo figure as subhuman, simple-minded, superstitious, submissive to whites, frequently childlike in his dependence, with foolishly exaggerated qualities like an inherently hereditary clumsiness and an addictive craving for fried chicken and watermelon. The most prominent representation of this type was Step and Fetch It, who perfected the slow-gated, dim-witted demeanor that the role demanded and his name implied. Just parse that name, Step and Fetch It. Another was Willie Best, better known by the equally degrading nickname of Sleep and Eat. The Sambo's female counterpart was a comic character best personified by the simple-minded housemaid Prissy, played by Butterfly McQueen in Gone with the Wind. Light-hearted, squeamish, and inclined to exaggeration, Prissy, who is Scarlet's personal slave throughout most of the story, provides much of the film's light comic relief, as she pretends to have some experiences of a midwife, but then is forced to admit in her singularly whiny high-pitched voice that she don't know nothing about birth and no babies. Because after all, according to most white film producers, every plantation and slavery saga was an opportunity for laughter and light comedy. So they piled on the laughs with these exaggerated cartoonish figures. There was many variations on this comic character type as there were black actors relegated to the demeaning role. A particularly common version was the so-called Piccaninny, a staple of early shorts and of plantation pieces. Probably film's most recognizable Piccaninny and one of film's most damning early examples of racist portraiture was Topsy, the wild slave child entrusted to Aunt Ophelia for moral and social instruction in the many versions of Uncle Tom's Cabin. In one widely viewed early adaptation, the 1927 movie Topsy and Eva, the very white and the very blonde Duncan sisters brought their unabashedly vulgar vaudeville minstrel act to the screen. In the film, Eva is safely delivered on Valentine's Day by a doctor after the stork visits her beautiful family home. Topsy is delivered a few weeks later on April Fool's Day by a black stork who drops her into a barrel of trash. Eventually, Topsy is purchased by Little Eva at a slave auction for only a nickel because no one else even bids. Topsy then proceeds to turn life on the plantation into an utterly foolish blackface version of the Keystone Cops as she flies downhill on borrowed skis, lands on top of a snowshoe-wearing horse, and leaps playfully onto cakes of ice. Slave life, the garish and insipid film implies, is nothing but a series of laugh-out-loud low-comic adventures to be savored by white audiences. <laughs> 
there are many other damaging racial stereotypes as well, such as the oversexed temptress or Jezebel who seduces and betrays the white men who fall under her sway a type that was popularized by D.W. Griffith's 1915 Birth of a Nation, that undisputed masterpiece of filmmaking and venomous compilation of the most vicious racism. The temptress's male counterpart was the lusting, hulking black brute who terrorizes and seeks to sully, and especially to deflower, white women. Also popularized by Griffith's film, that figure reappeared in the films of other white filmmakers who employed his character as an argument for the need to repress and control what they alleged were innately violent and hateful black men. Closely related was the stereotype of the malicious mulatto, that is the mixed blood character, half black, half white, who tries to insinuate himself or more often herself into white society by passing and who pollutes and attempts to undermine the white race with their racial impurity. The great irony with respect to this stereotype is the fact that the mulatto was usually the product of the relationship between the so-called planter class and the slave class. In other words, typically the child of a white man and his black slave. So the racial taint that whites found so abhorrent in the mulatto was actually a consequence of a deliberate and likely violent act by a white man, which was the converse of Griffith's sport of highly sexualized black men lusting after, preying upon, and terrorizing white women. The cinematic depiction of the mulatto derived from the passing trope in literature, which was explored by numerous writers, including black authors, Francis E.W. Harper, Charles Chestnut, James Weldon Johnson, Jesse Fawcett, and Nella Larson, who used it to expose the racial disparities in American society. For white filmmakers though, the mulatto figure was far more insidious and irredeemably evil. Her racial taint contributed directly to her treachery and served as the basis for some misfortune or tragic event. In the picture in Slavery Days, for example, Carlotta, an octoroon substitute during childhood for the daughter of the Warner family, turns into a half-caste monster who, out of jealousy over a suitor, tries to sell the real daughter into slavery. And in the wildly popular The Octoroon, based on the play by Dion Busico, the octoroon of the title brings sorrow to all who are associated with her. Similarly, in the debt, a man fathers children by both his wife and his octoroon mistress. The children meet, and the night before they are to be married, discover the truth of their sibling relationship. But the film makes clear the problem is not so much that the two are actually brother and sister, but rather it's the presence or the mere suspicion of Black blood. Sometimes filmmakers manage to offend Black audiences even more blatantly by piling on every stereotype possible, as in the early cartoon called Lazy Town Laundry Scrub Me Mama with a Boogie Beat by Walter Lance, the same person who gave us the lovable Woody Woodpecker. I won't dignify it by showing it here, but if you want, you can Google it and you can see for yourselves. The degrading roles to which Blacks were consigned on screen by their very nature relegated them to the background and contributed further to the sense of Black erasure in cinema. In some cases, that erasure was literal. In parts of the South, for example, entire production numbers featuring Black performers would be cut in order to placate white audiences who didn't want to see Black enter entertainers showcased in prominent roles. That happened to Lena Horne and Dorothy Dandridge, whose solo scenes were often cut from the scenes in which they appeared. Black absence also extended to the theaters where mainstream white films were shown. Since segregation practices ensured that most movie houses accommodated only white patrons, Blacks were restricted to occasional off-hour movie screenings called Midnight Rambles, to the colored-only sections of select theaters pejoratively called Buzzard's Roost or Crow's Nest, which they entered and exited through separate doors away from the view of whites, or to black theaters, sometimes called race or ghetto theaters, which opened to accommodate the new black audiences but struggled financially to survive. In fact, as late as 1929, when Hallelujah, one of Hollywood's first all black cast musicals, was released in New York City, it premiered simultaneously at two very different venues the downtown embassy on Broadway for white film goers, and the uptown Lafayette Theater in Harlem for blacks. The dual premiere allowed white audiences the comfort of watching scenes of Black song, dance, and revivalist religion at a safe remove, that is, without having to engage with actual Blacks. Theater owners typically defended such segregation in some absurd and egregious ways. For example, by su suggesting that Black moviegoers had a different smell, which offended sensitive female patrons and therefore warranted racial segregation. And let's keep that kind of bigotry in mind when we hear about current attempts to ban or otherwise censor race or gender themed books or discussions because they might make someone 
uncomfortable. That's a standard as spurious, capricious, and dangerous today as it was a century ago. Discrimination was also evident in disproportionately low salaries that many Black actors were paid by the major studios and in the humiliating treatment they received, both on location where they would be forced to seek substandard segregated accommodations and on the lots where they were restricted to special areas for their breaks and rarely allowed to socialize with their white co-stars. So as you can see, early movies underscored the racial and social divide and reinforced the racist characterizations in many ways. Through their repeatability, movies off-printed false racial models from the screen onto the culture, and real viewers came to expect unreal Blacks on screen and in the real world. Not only in small communities throughout the United States where residents had never personally encountered Blacks, but also in countries throughout the world where American films were shown, the racially polarizing film imagery fixed in people's imagination, the impressions of Blacks as ludicrous and cartoonish figures prone to frenzy, dancing, garish dress, drinking, dice tippling, torturing the language, and inevitably stealing watermelons and chicken, and who therefore required the indulgence and the intervention of their white intellectual superiors. And that image was especially disgraceful and outrageous in terms of the representation of women. Unfortunately, the lack of a strong visual past made it difficult for Blacks, and particularly for Black women, to counter the radical distortions. It's little wonder, therefore, that Black moviegoers found such early character depictions to be grossly inaccurate and harmful, or that they sought out films that would speak to their particular cultural experiences and offer effective visual models of race ambition and uplift. Those models would come in the new genre of pictures created in the 1910s and 1920s by independent race producers who committed themselves to addressing the concerns of a neglected but steadily increasing market of black moviegoers. Race films were quite simply films aimed almost exclusively at black audiences, featuring black actors and actresses and centering on black themes and issues. Instead of just perpetuating crude and retrogressive representations, race filmmakers determined to present realistic depictions of Black Americans by creating an alternate set of cultural reference and establishing new Black character types and situations, particularly those that reflected post-World War I social changes. As one early race filmmaker observed, unlike white moviegoers who had long based their idea of the Negro on the step and fetch it character, the Negro himself was tired of seeing that type of picture. He wanted to see himself as he really was. Race films afforded that opportunity. As products created by and for the black community, they became a way of producing images that didn't go through white culture. Seen by Blacks, largely unseen by whites, they featured an all Black world, and above all, one with which Black moviegoers could readily identify. And while race films did not by any means shatter the racial cliches or halt the negative imagery that dominated American film, they offered a clear alternative to those troubling depictions and challenged other movie producers to strive for more balanced racial and ethnic portrayals in their pictures. So in short, race filmmakers responded to the stereotyping of Black characters and the egregious misrepresentation of Black lives, stereotypes that had reached a kind of zenith with Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation in 1915, and that were perpetuated by other white filmmakers for the next few decades, by producing films that would counter the negative visual imagery. The presentations that follow in this program series will explore the pioneering work of some of those remarkable and landmark race filmmakers who strove to present more accurate and sympathetic portrayals of Black life and especially of Black women. My presentation will demonstrate how pioneering Florida-born filmmaker Richard E. Norman rejected the all too familiar racial tropes and instead introduced intelligent, independent, and educated Black women in his pictures, particularly in his feature film, The Flying Ace, to which you can link from our website. Dr. Gerald R. Butters Jr. discusses the ways that prolific race filmmaker Oscar Mishaw centered Black women and portrayed often graphically some of the historical injustices they endured from education limitations to threats of violence and lynching. And you can link from our website directly to two of Mishaw's finest silent films, Within Our Gates and The Symbol of the Unconquered. In his presentation on race, women, and uplift, Ken Fox, head of library and archives at the George Eastman Museum, explores some of the struggles, especially with issues of racial caste that black women faced as portrayed in the films produced by the Philadelphia-based Colored Players Film Corporation. His talk links to the company's two extant films, The Scar of Shame, considered by many film scholars today to be among the finest films of its age, black or white, and Ten Nights in a Barroom. 
The final presenter, Dr. Christina Baker, examines Black women as filmmakers and reveals how Alois Gist and uh, Zora Neale Hurston portrayed a vital role behind the camera. Dr. Baker's presentation links to clips from the films as well as to surviving footage of Hurston's pioneering fieldwork in Florida. All of these exceptional race filmmakers, as the presenters will demonstrate, were at a significant disadvantage in terms of experience, financing, and distribution of their productions. Yet ultimately, they surmounted enormous odds in the burgeoning film industry to produce films that provided a visual space for Black members of society and that countered dominant white cinemas, racial politics, and on-screen racist portrayals. In particular, by depicting Black women who were independent and accomplished, these filmmakers were in the vanguard of social and racial change and their contribution both to American cinema and to American sociopolitics should not and must not be forgotten. In fact, it has to be honored. In her 1993 Nobel Prize lecture, the late great Toni Morrison spoke of sexist and racist language that discourages the mutual exchange of ideas and she reinforced the importance of confronting what she called racist plunder and then rejecting, altering, or exposing it. To Morrison's words, I would add this. Today, cinema is our communal language. From its inception in the late 19th century, it's been a mirror of our beliefs and aspirations and fears and prejudices and values. By exploring the genesis of the cinematic stereotypes that defined and restricted and distorted the reality of African Americans, we can see how that ugly and pervasive imagery has influenced social thought and practice, and how its reverberations are in some ways even stronger in these divisive times. We therefore need to begin a more informed discussion and not a merely anecdotal one about race representation and race and gender relations. In other words, we need to initiate a vital community conversation. So I invite you to join us in exploring this timely and crucial topic of the representation of African-American women in early silent film and to celebrate the achievement of the exceptional but still largely underappreciated filmmakers who determined to reverse the unfortunate stereotypes and to create more accurate racial and gender cinematic and social imagery. I hope you will listen to the video presentations by our team of scholars. Check out the video links to the corresponding films, which I think you're going to find fascinating and surprising, and use the suggestions for further reading and viewing and the discussion questions that have been provided to stimulate further meaningful dialogue. Thank you once again to the Norman Studio Silent Film Museum for sponsoring this program series and to Florida Humanities for supporting it with a community action grant. And thank you to all of you for being part of that important community.